Good morning, everybody. And for yes. those morning. who are joining us from the Netherlands, good afternoon. My name is Monique Alberts, and I'm the manager of the Mongi Maduro Library, and I'm so happy to see you all here. Welcome to this first Mongi Maduro webinar of 2022. Our topic today is the history of the British West Indian immigrants of Curaçao. And our library is so happy that we found Dr. Irving Andre willing to present this webinar for us. A few months ago, we were able to obtain a copy of Dr. Andre's book, Strangers in Sufi Sound. And I really found it a fascinating read. Um, there are others who research the British West Indies immigrants. For example, wrote Professor Rosemary Allen. But Dr. Irving uh, described the history from, from a different perspective. So that's why I found it so uh, fascinating. And of course, I was shocked to read about the racial and cultural, cultural xenophobia the British West Indians uh, encountered. So that was really a shock to me. But it was good to read about the influence they had on the social and cultural life, uh, introducing cricket, calypso, Christmas caroling, things that we are still doing. And yeah, nowadays, we can't imagine a Curacao without the descendants of these English speaking Caribbean uh, families. I have a few facts about our presenter. I think may, most of you know him, but uh, yeah. So um, he studied in Jamaica, history and philosophy at the University of the West Indies. He graduated with honors. He studied briefly at Johns Hopkins University, Osgood Hall Law School at York University in Canada. And since 2002, uh, Dr. Irving is a judge. He currently presides at the Superior Court of Justice in Brampton, Canada. He is the author of uh, numerous publications, which are mostly related uh, to Dominica. So we are very honored to have Dr. Irving Andre here in our virtual meeting room. Uh, before I start, I want to let you know that if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat section of your screen. And you can, uh, some of the questions, uh, Dr. Irving will answer right away. And, but at the end, we will also have a Q&A session. So uh, then we can discuss the questions at length. Uh, now, without further ado, I will pass the mic to Dr. Irving Andre. I will stop uh, start sharing with the first picture. Uh, let me stop my own video. Share screen. Uh, this one, right? Yep. All right. Should I start, uh, Monique? Yes, please. Let me mute myself. All right. Let me say uh, a pleasant bon dia to all the participants, the panelists. Uh, obviously, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. I, I wish to thank uh, the Mongu Maduro Library in organizing this webinar. Uh, I think it's a gracious of them to have done so. Um, uh, I should indicate also that it is quite appropriate uh, uh, given the interest of this library in the social cultural history of Curacao and particularly the history of the Jewish presence in Curacao. It's quite appropriate because I can indicate that uh, my mother who traveled to Curacao in the late forties, her first job was with working as a nanny in a Jewish family called the Teitelbaums. And she always talked about how well she was treated by that family uh, to a point that uh, they actually gave her room in their homes. And I think many of those of us who are descendants of uh, uh, persons from the British West Indies who spent some time in Kyrgyzstan uh, can reflect perhaps and hopefully on the positive influence that uh, that experience had. Uh, one of the pictures that we're looking at uh, is, is a picture of a cricket team in the late 40s in Curacao. And uh, there are different persons there. I, I wouldn't go through everyone, but one on the seated on the right is a Dominican fellow called Herbert Bertrand. Now it's an interesting from a Curacao, Curacao perspective because Herbert Bertrand is the father of a local Curacao attorney called Carol Bertrand who hopefully will either be listening or will be joining us shortly. Um, there are a number of other persons I'll talk about. And the significance in my view of this presentation is that 
it hopefully will help to dispel some of the types of stereotypes which some of these immigrants had to contend with, particularly in the 1940s and the 1950s. Um, the history of the islands is essentially the product of a history of slavery. Slavery was abolished in the islands in 1834. The British compensated the slave owners, but did not compensate the slaves, with the result that in many of the islands, impoverished islands, you had a dearth of employment and you had a migration, a phenomenon of migration from the late 19th century onwards. So that Dominicans, St. Lucians, Vincentians, Grenadians continuously migrated, if not to some of the larger islands in the Eastern Caribbean, such as Trinidad and in South America, British Guyana, but later on to Panama in the early 20th century to, to the Dominican Republic in search of employment, to Cuba in search of employment, and in the 1930s to Curacao. Indeed, between 1925 and 1930, 3,000 British West Indians went to Curacao to work in the oil fields. They worked there until on about 1930. And in 1930, what we have is the establishment of a pattern in terms of how these immigrants were treated. With the onset of the Great Depression in 1930, you had many of thousands of these workers repatriated to their respective islands. Many of them were herded, literally, onto a ship called the Mayflower, and they were transported, many against their will, to their respective island. There was something positive, however, arising out of that forced uh, repatriation. One of the persons, at least of Dominican individuals, who, uh, who, who was repatriated was a, a gentleman called Robert Bernard Douglas. Now, Robert Bernard Douglas is somewhat of a legend in Dominica. Through the savings he accumulated while working, while working in Curacao, he was able to purchase huge swaths of land to the point that by the 60s and 70s, he became one of the biggest landowners in, in, in Dominica. He was also the patriarch of a political dynasty. Some of your listeners or your panelists may know the name of Michael Douglas, who served uh, in the House of Assembly from 1975 to 1972. Robert Douglas himself also served as a member of the Legislative Council, first in 1951, then in 1954. And then uh, basically he focused on his myriad business interests. Another one who was repatriated was a gentleman called Lionel Flaubert Laville, also becoming a huge landowner based on account or largely on account of the income that he was able to save from his sojourn in Kiriso. So this is the historical context, which takes us to the 1940s. In the 1940s, with the onset of World War II, the British wanted help from the Americans. The British offered Americans spaces on some of the West Indian possessions to establish military bases. In exchange, the British promised labor promised labor who would gravitate towards Kiriso and Aruba to boost the production of petrol used by the American war machine in its, the prosecution of the war against first the Germans and then later the Japanese. I can indicate to you that uh, by 1942 or by 1943, the recruitment of West Indian labor to Curacao and Aruba had commenced in, in earnest. There were three categories of workers. There were those who had attended secondary school. There were those who, attend, who had attended primary school. And there were those who, who had acquired skills, industrial skills. And these three categories of workers were recruited to work on the oil in the oil industry in these two islands. I can indicate to you that by 1952, Kiriso had about 12,600 foreign workers, 40% of whom were from the British West Indian Islands. And you may ask, well, what was so attractive about the prospect of working in Kiriso and the Yuba? Well, the attractions were quite enormous. The islands were quite destitute, literally, 
in the 1930s and 1940s. In the 1930s, there had been a British commission called the Moyne Commission that had done a study of poverty in the islands and had found that the islands were being besieged by excruciating poverty. In contrast, working in Curacao was almost like an El Dorado, a golden opportunity. The oil company manifested itself to these workers as a benevolent despot. Note the last word, please, a benevolent despot. The company provided all the creatures of comfort. The workers earned a wage, which perhaps was two, three times, four times as much than they could have earned in their respective islands. Healthcare was provided. Every four years, every foreign worker was given a free trip to his island. The workers were given money to have workers' councils. The workers initially, uh, initially upon the arrival, but partic particularly after 1943, uh, were made to live in barracks in Sufisat. After one year, the workers were moved to a nearby uh, location called Surinam Dorp. And after that, uh, some of them gravitated to another uh, small enclave called Stin Corral. The workers, uh, they established themselves. They had a mess hall. They had various clubs. They had athletics clubs, weightlifting, different cultural events. They actually um, had visitors from literally around the world. In fact, in one of the photographs that we will present, there's a picture of a smiling Joe Louis. Well, I shouldn't say smiling. Joe Louis, the formidable heavyweight boxing champion of the world, visiting Curacao and interfacing with some of these British West Indian workers. The company also organized for some workers who had that interest to send money to their respective islands. And many workers accumulated what, at least by the standards of the day, fairly significant sums or savings through the assistance of the Shell Oil Company in both Curacao and Aruba. Ah, but as you would imagine, there was a dark cloud to that degree of generosity by the oil workers. There was one bridge which no worker could cross. That is to say, the right to form a union, the right to gravitate towards collective bargaining. That was taboo. The work, the union, the company denied workers of that fundamental right. It was either you take it or you leave it. And if you were dismissed by the Shell Company, you would be repatriated to Curacao. One famous example of one person who was repatriated after trying to form a union was Eric Gary, the former prime minister of Grenada, who was deported on or about 1949. He went back to Grenada, became involved in politics and rose to become prime minister, but not before becoming an autocrat, to be quite honest with you. Another person of Grenadian vintage, who also um, uh, cut his teeth in Aruba, was Herbert was Herbert Bishop. Is it Herbert, the father of uh, Morris Bishop, uh, the late uh, the late Prime Minister of, uh, of 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 Grenada? But that is the context in which West Indians gravitated towards Curacao. They were offered an opportunity to do well. They were offered the perks of a decent job. They were offered the ability to socialize, to interact with other West Indians. And one of the unheralded consequences of that effort, of that movement, was that many workers from the islands, they only learned that they were West Indians after they migrated to Curacao, because they were interacting for the very first time with workers from some of the other islands with whom they had significant historical affinities. And that was a very powerful force in, in, in the movement of many of those persons afterwards. But the dark reality which many confronted many workers was that they faced a degree of ostracism, a degree of discrimination. Now, I happen to know that, um, I should indicate that my father traveled to Curacao in 1943, and came back to Dominica in 1961. And uh, my parents never talked about the experiences in Curacao. And as I grew older, that surprised me. I was born in Curacao. 
In, in 2012, I visited Kirchhoff and I was shepherded around by Carol Bertrand, attorney, uh, whose father, as I indicated, was Dominican. And I was very surprised and taken back by the reluctance of some of those persons we met to even acknowledge their West Indian ancestry. I was bothered by it, quite frankly. What is there to be shy about? But I got a deeper insight into this by speaking to a couple of persons who had been there for a significant period. One of the ladies I spoke to was the lady, she's moved on, she's transitioned. Her name was Daphne Revere Ni Signoret. Now I noticed that one of the persons who's listening is someone called um, uh, Herbert Signoret. Now I don't know if that person is, is related, but I spoke to this lady and she gave me insights into what these initial group of workers experienced in 1940s and the 1950s, which I hadn't quite frankly discussed with my parents. Some of the things she related to me, and I should indicate that her husband, the gentleman from, Ma, from uh, Maho, a small village in Dominica, had actually was one of the few foreign workers to have ascended the corporate ladder in, in the oil river Henry. She told me that some of these workers were disparagingly referred to as English, as BG, as Shushi. Yes, thank you. As Sushi, yes. As Stinky. In fact, I can indicate to you, and I got it from another person I interviewed, the mother of uh, one of the persons I met in Curacao, that when they went to church, the nuns would tell the persons, the, the, the young ladies, Curacao ladies, beware of these British West Indian workers. They have tails between their legs. Many of them have left their families in their respective islands to come to work in Curacao. They will use you and then dismiss you as if you were the plague. So there was this antipathy which was generated towards many of these West Indian workers. And that is one of the reasons why you had very few unions between British West Indians and Kyoso women, because there was a stigma attached to that, that union. One of the few I know, I've made mention reference to Hubert Bertrand, married a wonderful Kyoso lady. Her daughter still lives in, 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 in Kyoso. Maggie Bertrand, uh, a Calypso, a kind of a lover, so to speak. She transitioned a few years ago. There's another person who may be listening, or at least his daughter, Gordon Bristol. He married a, a Curacao lady. And again, in negation of the stereotypes, they are still married over 60 years after they got married. And one of his friends told me with great pride, they are still on honeymoon. Yeah. So that Dr. these Andre, yes. Um there are to feel, there are uh, quite some people joining us um who are either uh, are even recognizing their family on the picture of the cricket. Um there is Miss Shirley Fowler and Mr. James Tubler who see their father on the picture you um have uh, now. And we also have a reaction from uh, Mr. Hubert Seidert. I'm seeing it say Signoret. Signoret. Yes. Signoret. Yes. So there are quite some persons who are recognizing their family and uh, in the story and in the, on the picture you have here right now. Well, I'm happy about that because this is a lived history. This is a lived experience. It's a living history. And in my view, I'm an amateur historian, or should I say I am an unemployed historian. <laughs> it is very imperative to me that the history of the Caribbean, the history of our people should be brought out there it is not just a history of being hewers of water or drawers of water and hewers of wood. It's a history of accomplishment. And I'll come to that a little later. So it's important that we understand that. So these workers had to contend with these stereotypes. Well, what type of person who would have left their respective island to go to, 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 to Kyrgyzstan? Um, I can indicate. Now, the picture you've just showed coincidentally is a picture of the married, the married couple in 1949, Hazel Peter. As we speak, his son, 
who now lives in Calgary, Alberta, is now listening and looking and looking at the picture of his father and mother who got married in Curacao in 1949. So this is fantastic. But persons such as Mr. Peter, there's a member, there's a family, a Murino family from the Northeast village in Dominica. Seven members of that family migrated to Curacao. Four brothers, three sisters. Two of the brothers, one brother called Destin Morillon, the other called Von Morillon. They formed a stand and student company in, uh, how do you pronounce it? Maniana? Man something. Man, uh, Montagna. Montagna. Uh, Montagna. 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 Very successful company. One of the few brothers or migrants who did not gravitate towards the oil industry. At least they did initially, but later founded their own company and they became very successful. As I said, my father was, the, was, was in the second group who went uh, uh, to, to Kiriso, along with a number of others. And uh, my father, his passage in Kiriso um, reflected that of many. Um, because of his secondary education, he was put to work in the, uh, in the lab, the lab of the, uh, of, of, of the oil company. One of the persons he worked with was a Monstratian fellow called Percival Austin Bramble. Now, West Indian students may, re may recognize the name Percival Austin Bramble became a chief minister of Monstrat uh, years after his sojourn in uh, Kiriso. And here's another picture of the Peters in 1949, uh, the, mar the, the marital group um, uh, as they basked in the sunlight of Kiriso. And look at the look at the attire. And that is one of the attractions with uh, being in Kiriso that uh, you acquired a certain degree of sartorial splendor, let's put it this way. And when we see another picture soon to come of uh, a group of my siblings and I, uh, you will see a, a better exhibit of that and so on. So moving to Kiriso was a search for opportunity. Here is a picture of uh, a gentleman called Oscar Rivera. Oscar Rivera was the brother of this Rivera fellow who married Daphne Senioret. And that is a picture of them in marriage sometimes in either the late 40s or the early 1950s. Again in Caruso, look at the finery, look at the, well, what do I know about them, um, about fabric? But again, you can see they're all Natalie attired. I think you their know. son is um, attending with us, Paul Riviere. Sorry? Yes. I see your name, oh. Paul Riviere. It my mo be, my it mother and father is commenting. Well, there we go. There we go. Yes. So this is wonderful. This is wonderful. I'm happy that at least they could see some of that. Because this is a history one has to be proud of. And think of the impact. Think of the significance of the oil industry. And when you think of the significance of the oil industry in the 40s and 50s, you think of the contributions. And here's a group of uh, ladies from the islands in carnival revelry, dressed uh, in, in, in the Curacao, well, answer to the costumes and so on. Um, but, but think of the significance of the oil industry. I have some figures which I quoted in my book. Between 1942 and 1943, the two refineries in Aruba and in Curacao, they provided 100% of the fuel used by the American army to prosecute the war in North Africa. Between 1944 and 1945, 75% of the fuel used by the American army to fight the war in the Pacific came from Aruba and Curacao. And speaking of Aruba, I can see one of your, 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 your listeners is, is a gentleman called Rika Delamere. Now, I don't know if it's a gentleman or a gentle lady, but I can indicate to her that in the city where I live in Toronto, there's a guy called Hubert Delamere. He's an engineer, retired now, um, who actually was born and raised in, uh, in, in Aruba before he traveled to Dominica where he attended secondary school. And he became a teacher at the uh, Dominica Grammar School before he migrated to Canada. Here's a group of young children of West, uh, West Indians uh, at a, a preschool uh, in Curacao. Now I wouldn't expect some of your Panelists, he is my brother. Okay, Rika is saying that Hubert Delamere is her brother. 
I wouldn't expect your panelists to recognize themselves in these young urchins who are looking so enthusiastic um, under the tutelage of their te top teachers. But, 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 but that is the contribution that British West Indians, and in fact, Kiraso workers, made towards the war effort. In 1950, a newspaper published by the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People Based in America, indicated that in 1950 alone, the Shell Oil Company made a $167 million profit based on the labor provided by British West Indians and provided by Curacao workers. Now, there were other workers from Holland, from, 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 uh, from Portugal, if my memory is correct, who also worked at the, on the, 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 um, on, on the companies, but the hard work, the work which made production possible was conducted by British West Indian workers and by Curacao workers. Uh, one of the workers that we are talking about, there is he, he is a guy, a Grenadian called Walter McNeely. He's doing some type of work in the, in, in the factory. Walter McNeely left Curacao on about 1959 when he saw the writing on the wall because the Dutch authorities had started repatriating workers uh, just uh, a couple of years earlier. He went to Toronto, he qualified to go to the University of Toronto to study medicine. He qualified as a doctor and he worked for decades in a city called Hamilton which is about one hour's drive west of Toronto. That's Walter McNeely. But these workers, as I said, they came, and here is a shot of workers socializing um, uh, in Sufisant, perhaps uh, at the home of a, a private individual. But you can see how naturally attired that they all are. And uh, they're interacting and socializing, as I said, for the first time, perhaps in their, in, in their lives they regarded themselves as West Indians because none or very few escaped the dragnet of discrimination in Kyushu. And that accounts for, and we'll come to that, why there was a significant amount of repatriation towards the end of the 50s when the demand for petrol abated, when it decreased. Uh, but the workers endured they didn't do any protesting and so on. Many of them were there for a specific reason, and we'll come to that shortly. They were there for a specific reason. And here is another club which the workers formed, the Olympia Cycling Club. Again, what you see here, a group of British West Indian workers uh, who had come together, formed this club, and uh, that is one of the activities that they organized. I can also indicate that there were attempts by the British West Indian workers to bridge the gap between themselves and the local Curacao community. In fact, they would organize Christmas uh, activities at the mess hall in Sufisant, and they would invite families in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood. And after these events, workers would escort these families back to their respective homes. So this, there were certainly attempts to, uh, to certainly in, uh, um, uh, make them realize that, look, we're not what you may think that we are. And one of the biggest initiatives, and here is a young, a young boy and girl celebrating the first communion uh, uh, in Kirisho. Uh, they were dressed in accordance with the traditions of the, of the times. And, but one of the biggest institutions taken by the authorities was their complicity in the introduction of a, 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 a place called Campo Alegre. Campo Alegre was established in 1949. It had a hundred sex workers, sex trade worker, workers. That's the name that they know. That's the name, appropriate name. 
And what was significant, according to two historians who looked at that in some fashion and who I quoted in my book, was that at the time in the late 40s, as opposed to now, the Dutch government was vehemently opposed to these types of institutions. But with the establishment of Camp Allegri by a private person, Dutch person, I should say, in Curso, the move was embraced by the chief of police by the Minister of Health, and most surprisingly, by the church. Why? Because Camp Allegri served as a buffer between these horny West Indian workers and the Curacao ladies. So that when you have Camp Allegri with its 100 sex workers, the need or the urgency or the concern or the apprehension about West Indian workers gravitating towards the local ladies, that would dissipate. And that was one of the reasons. And here's a picture showing no less a figure than Joe Louis with, uh, with uh, a couple of uh, our workers, uh, but in right there in Curacao. Joe Louis, as uh, most of you don't need to be told, um, uh, the, uh, the box heavyweight boxing champion, one of the best ever uh, in the world. Um, and, 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 but so they established that, that institution. Because again, this existential fear of these workers existed, despite the true significant contribution they were making to Kirsho. Here is a picture again, and I should indicate that is in a reflection of the, what appeared to be a proactive or progressive approach by the old company. They helped to sponsor teams, in this case, a cricket team. And you have cricketers, West Indian cricketers in Kirsho, uh, playing matches against West Indian cricketers in Aruba and so on and so forth. And you can see the uniforms that they had all provided by the oil company. And I can indicate that, um, but by the late 1950s, yes, here's another picture. By the late 1950s, the need of following the end of the World War II and following the, I guess, the Great Depression, the demand for petrol dissipated. And there was a need again to protect the local population from these immigrant workers. They were the first to be released by the company. And once you were released, you had very little option but to return. You could either return to your island, you could return to England, you could return, I mean, you could travel to England, you could travel to the United States, you could travel to Canada. And it's a reflection of the caliber of these workers that so many of them achieved a great success after having to leave Kirso. I made a reference to some of these folk. I can indicate to you that quite a few became doctors. If you have any listeners of British West Indian origin in the States, they make a recall a name called Cecil Duverney, a Dominican. He went to the United States. He went to Howard University, studied medicine, practiced medicine in New York for decades. I've mentioned Walt Charles McNeely. There's another gentleman called Floyd Cobe from Grenada, studied medicine in California, practiced as a physician. Many of these migrants, they traveled to Canada because Canada had the reputation of being a place where you could get ahead through education. Many of them became educators. I made mention of one called Arthur Charles, another one, Mr. de Tourville, and the gentleman who I spoke to, who was the most instrumental in uh, this book, was a gentleman from St. Vincent called Elmo Daisy. Elmo Daisy was the manager of the University of Toronto bookstore in one of its campuses. And I met him through my in-laws and he provided signif a significant amount of information to me about their experiences. Most importantly, he also provided me with a number of albums detailing pictorially because he was an amateur photograph, photographer. Um, uh, some of these workers and, uh, and the lives that they led. And again, it just reinforced in my view, not that I need any reinforcement, 
that many of these workers, quite frankly, use Kiriso as a stepping stone, particularly when the door of remaining, that door was closed, they gravitated toward greater or greener pastures and many of them succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. Um, this is one of the reasons why we have to deal with these types of issues. We can't sweep it under the carpet. And I say that because bear in mind what I said a little earlier, I was struck in 2012 that there were few folks who were staying in origin who were somewhat shy, reluctant, apprehensive about speaking about their past as if it was something to be ashamed of. In fact, it's a past which is symbolic of success, of achievement. And, uh, and that is the message. And, and look at, uh, Kiriso contributed significantly through these immigrants, through these immigrant workers in a number of different spheres. Let, let us take the, the sphere of politics. I've made mention of Percival Austin Bramble who became chief minister of Mountstrat. I've made mention of Eric Geary. I haven't as yet made mention of Herbert Blairs who became the first chief minister of Grenada. I haven't made mention about Compton. I think it's George Compton of St. Lucia also became a chief minister in St. Lucia. I have made mention of Robert Bernard Douglas, who became a member of the Legislative Council. Um, all of those first, I've, I haven't even made mention of, of, of um, Robert Bradshaw, who also traveled into the islands, probably before the influx in the 40s, and who certainly cut his teeth from an employment perspective. In, uh, I believe it was Kiriso. It could be Ruba, but I believe it was Kiriso. So these folks, I can indicate to you that I spoke to um, Bramble at length, and he told me his experiences working for the company molded his socially democratic, his social democratic views. So that when he became the chief minister of Monstrat, his policies reflected a scrupulous anxiety to improve the lot of the workers in Montserrat. Bear in mind, Eric Gary started as a unionist, a chief proponent of workers' rights. Now he became something else in the 1970s, totally. And ironically, one of the acts that he was responsible for was, if the historical records are correct, the untimely death of the father of Maurice Bishop. But the experiences in Kiriso molded and fashioned the, socially, the social democratic views of many of these individuals. And many of them were stimulated to achieve great success after they left Kiriso. I've made mention about Herbert Delamere already. There are numerous others. There's a gentleman who died, unfortunately, about two or three years ago called Leonard Fletcher. Actually, let me give him his respect, Dr. Leonard Fletcher. After Kiriso, he went to the United States. He got a PhD from Brown University. He became a professor emeritus in economics at the Utah University of Waterloo, Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. And there's a Dr. Charles Callender, also from Grenada, achieved the PhD in economics at the University of the West Indies. He worked with the university and he worked with the UN. This is what we're talking about. They acquitted themselves very well. And when I, I can indicate to you, when I, I informed myself of that history, it made me feel much better. I can indicate when my father left Kiriso in 61, um, my mother uh, wasn't exactly the happiest of brides because she wanted him to go to England. He didn't, he wanted to go back to his island. And you never second guess life. He then went back to Dominica, he did well, he acquitted himself well, became control of customs and so on. But one of the things he brought from Kiriso, in addition to his family, was his love of books. Because in Kiriso, he would order Reader's Digests, Time Magazine, a, a, a habit he continued. And he amassed a little library in Kiriso. And I can indicate that growing up in Dominica, in the late 60s and early 70s. I feasted on many of these books, although the little roaches feasted on them before me. And that helped molded 
that helped to mold my own uh, my own interest in life from an academic and intellectual perspective. So the legacy continues. So I stand on the shoulders of giants, literally and symbolically. The more I learn about that aspect of our history, the more I feel better about myself. And so, as I said, when I went to Kiraso, I visited Kiraso. I was disheartened by what I perceived to be, quite frankly, a hesitance and reluctance to accept that part of our existence. Because let's face it, discrimination does not belong to Kiraso. It is something that we have to contend with, or most of us have had to contend with in various spheres of the world. But the fact of the matter is our existence has to be defined by the extent to which we can transcend these restrictions, to which we can overcome them, to which we can supersede them. And that is what we are about. That is how we build our metal. But coming back to Kiraso, I can understand, I could understand, although that was over 50 or 60 years after the first onset of, of British West Indians, to Kiraso in the 1940s and also in Dorua. I can understand the attraction Leo, because compared to the, my island, there was an ordered prodigality. There was a beauty in, in, in the landscape. I admired the sense of history, the old market, the efforts to preserve the indigenous heritage of Kiraso, the old slave barracks, because I know that uh, in fact, in, 19, in 2012, I was told that uh, the Kiraso folks were, were, were in the process of, of doing a film about the great slave leader, Tula. And I think the person who was supposed to play Tula in that film was Danny Glover. And I know that he, in, inspired by the French Revolution in 1789, he, he started a revolt among slaves in Kiraso in 1795. And consistent with the pattern of slave owners, he was brutally executed in 1796. So there, at least there's a scrupulous attempt in Kiraso to preserve its past, its indigenous past, not to regard it as something to be ashamed of. And I, 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 I mused during the, that week I spent in Kiraso that I wish we in Dominica could have the same type of, same type of concern for the preservation of our historical past. I admired the architectural heritage in Willemstead. That is very important in the definition of any fledgling nation. It seems to me that it was an example being set for other islands in the Eastern Caribbean. So certainly I left Kiraso buoyed by the fact that at least I was able to at least visit uh, that site uh, where my navel strings were cut. I visited uh, where my folks lived in Groot Quartier. And in fact, um, uh, I was pleased that there was a Grenadian family who had befri befriended my family, who'd been in Kiraso for over 70 years. The Benjamin family, they're still there, at least uh, one of two of the daughters and perhaps a son still there right across the street from where my family uh, used to live. I visited the church where I, I was baptized and um, I did, uh, was interviewed by uh, the husband of, uh, of, of Ms. Bertrand, the uh, lawyer. Um, um, and, and again, I basically shared my story um, because it's a story, as I said, I'm proud of. And uh, I can indicate that in no place I visit uh, do I have any reticence or reluctance to share that story? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I must. Does anyone else? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like you say, say uh, we're receiving quite some comments here from quite some people who are thanking you for sharing uh, these stories. And um, I think the most important of uh, um, your story and your book, uh, which I have here, and I have been reading also these days, I can't know, you, know, you can't see it very clearly. Um, I'll show it in a bit. Um, is the impact, like you were showing us through this uh, presentation in the morning, the um, important impact of the British uh, Caribbean immigrants in Curaçao, the role they played in, um, in being part of our fabric, of our cultural economic uh, fabric, but also um, the, um, what they went through, the, the ups and downs um, they, they went through, also being ostracized, being called uh, names, 
But um, in addition, before I go to the question, I think another part, um, I guess, maybe you can elaborate later on is uh, you were saying you liked reading books. Um, that's also how you came about. And I think especially reading books, um, the British uh, Caribbean immigrants being able to um, have the English language um, as their mother tongue. And at that moment in time, um, um, having the notion also that pr pr practically every newspaper, journal, important uh, or uh, books were published in English, that you had quite some access to knowledge um, that you were also sharing, because I know my father and other people, uh, Professor Yanni Paula and many of our scholars who lived and are living, uh, were able through the British Caribbean immigrants also to receive knowledge. So I guess that's also an important uh, contribution that um, the British immigrants um, added to our Curacao uh, knowledge. So um, um, I have quite some questions um, in line for you. I want Whenever to kick off. Ready. Yes, I want to kick off with the first um, from the, um, the um, a more general comment which is uh, the comments of uh, several from Daniel Serfors, who's uh, actually thanking you also for the lecture and eye-opening experience uh, from the Dutch and Dillian descents, um, and especially for the members of the British, uh, um, British West Indian community, that they can be very proud of the achievements here in Curacao and upon their return to their respective islands. And from that, I have a question from Mr. Mike Jacobs. Um, he's actually, at asking, um, compared to the other immigrant workers like the Sunamese, the Portuguese, etc., cetera, um, if the British West Indian Im English immigrants, um, they came from many different islands, was and is there still a kind of common identity um, in between them? And how were the relations between the many different English immigrants in Curacao? It's a great question. I can indicate to you based on my interviews that initially, the islanders or the migrants came to Curacao as Grenadians, Kittitians, St. Lucians, Dominicans, and so on, Vincentians. By the time, based on what I've been told, most of them left, they, were, they regarded themselves as West Indians. They regarded themselves as West Indians. They became aware of the fact that they share commonalities of history, of language, of culture, of experiences. And that was one of the unifying force of having worked in Kyrgyzstan. Many of them realized that they had similar aspirations. Many of them decided to go, whether it's to Canada or elsewhere, based on information or letters they received from those who had gone before them, even friends from different islands. So there where was a unifying bond on account of that common experience. And I can indicate to you growing up periodically, we, my family would have visits from persons from Curacao, whether from Grenada. Mm -hmm. I can indicate to you that one of my mother's sisters who also went to Curacao got married to a Grenada gentleman. And uh, periodically I would get visits. My father would get visits from Herbert Bertrand who was still in Curacao. And another component of Curacao, which they took with them, was the love of a certain type of music. Mm. My father acquired a great collection of the jazz greats, Sachimo, Nat King Cole, also of the, the Dominican Republic music. There was the Mambo King. What was his name? I think I wrote it down somewhere. Perez Prado and Tito Fuente. Mm. And every, every Sunday after my father, I had a few drinks celebrating his existence. The lane in which we live would resound because he brought his phonograph from Curacao with the songs of Perez Prado and Tito Puente and playing this Latin American music. And then that to be followed by the, 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 the records of some of the jazz greats. Yeah. So even in the question of music, another impact of Curacao on these islands is that Many of those who returned gravitated towards business. Many of them established businesses throughout Dominica. There's one, two villages in particular where the influence of Curacao was, was the strongest. One is a coastal village. Well, both of them are coastal villages. One is a southern coastal village called Point Michel, 
we have virtually 50% or even not more of the residents of Point Michel had has had relatives either in Aruba or in Curacao. Another village um, more towards the, the other end of Dominica is called St. Joseph. A certain area of St. Joseph became named as Otrobandu because one of the first returnees from that, uh, from that uh, village returned to Kyrus, to Dominica and he built a concrete building, something which obviously reflective a certain type of status. And many other returnees built within that area of that village called St. Joseph to a point that up to today, it is now known as Otrobando in recognition of those who returned from Kiroso. Yeah. So the whole question of music. One of the aspects of the Kiroso experience I didn't tell you, but again, it shouldn't be surprising, is that there was segregation even in living accommodation and in the beaches that you used. The West Indian workers were confined to stony beaches at Yantil or Spanswater, I think the name was. Dutch workers were relegated and were preserved in white sand beaches, even with, with, with barricades to prevent sharks from coming in. In that sense, I have a, a question from Dr. Rosemary Allen, who also sends her uh, uh, greetings to you and thank you for the presentation. In that sense, her question is, um, was it maybe because of the differences in religion that there were this um, the antagonistic attitudes toward people from the um, English Caribbean? The English immigrants? That is a great question. Uh, the religious thing, I, I try not to tread too deeply in because it has been the source of so many problems. <laughs> but religion should be a unifying force. Mm. Religion should teach you the equality of man, irrespective of their complexion or color or their island of origin. So I personally don't think for one minute it's religion. I think these were attitudes ingrained in folks at the time. We're talking about in the heyday initially anyway, of World War II. We're talking about an era where the so-called superiority of a certain race, the iron race, resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands or millions of people. In fact, on account of that, that, uh, that, that ideology, there were persons from Holland who'd fled to Curacao. One of them who turned out or happened to be have been my godmother. I don't know her Dutch name, but she married a Dominican chap called Allport, Robert Allport. And her, her, we knew her as Mia Allport. She died a few years ago, you know? So I may be wrong, but I, I don't attribute it to, to religion. You know, um, I attribute it just towards the conscious or unconscious racial bias um, directed at persons with whom we're not familiar with, with whom we attach certain stereotypes. That is what I attribute it to. I may be wrong, but uh, I don't see religion as justifying discrimination on account of race. Now, sadly, religion has been used to reinforce those discriminatory attitudes, to strengthen them. Yeah. Bear in mind, well, I, I want to stay on point on topic. So let's leave that alone. Okay. <laughs> but I have, uh, in that sense, another interesting question from um, Mr. or Mrs. Mayling, who says, thank you, um, um, they read reading your book also, you have been um, expressing or presenting a lot of success stories of the British, uh, West, um, the British immigrants to Curacao. Were there also stories of um, immigrants who also regretted their move towards Curacao? Why did they regret this? And what can we learn from these experiences? Are there lessons to be learned from those? Um, uh, it would be remiss of me to suggest that the stories were all success stories. I can indicate to you, and I think I hinted it in the book, that uh, while living in the barracks at Sufficent, um, uh, many workers developed what I can describe as unwelcome traits. Many became alcoholics. There were fights among workers, quite frankly. I know at least one case, there were serious uh, criminal repercussions because of a conflict uh, between someone from Curacao 
and one of the workers. Um, but that is inevitable. Um, that is inevitable. I can't tell you definitely whether there was anyone who was regretful of their experiences in Kerasol. Uh, I've indicated that, that uh, as far as my mother was concerned, we should have gone to England because many of my father's friends had gone that route. Um, uh, but, but that is not to suggest that she had any regrets whatsoever. In fact, as I indicated, I think as far as I'm concerned, based on the interviews I've had, uh, virtually all the persons I spoke to um, felt they were very fortunate to have had that springboard, you see? Um, because as I said, many of them gravitated towards countries like North America, in North America, Canada, United States, England, where quite frankly, <laughs> racism is alive and well. And uh, many of them on account of, of having to toil within an environment where they were regarded as aliens, they developed the resilience to succeed, to go to school, to work, and to return after many years from the adopted island to uh, to, uh, to to their their island of uh, origin. Yeah. So overall, it was a very positive experience, yeah. and it's it gave them fun. it gave them an economic advantage, which those who did not leave, or do, those who did not go to Trinidad or uh, to to Carousel or Aruba, they never had. Do you, do you know whether some of these British West Indian immigrants also ended up in the Netherlands during or after the Second World War? And I, I can give, some... mm -hmm. de definitely. Um, I can indicate that, um, uh, and, um, that there are some who remain in Canada. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the name Daphne Rivere, niece senioret. I know that one or two of her daughters went to the Netherlands Antilles. Mm -hmm. I know that another Dominican worker, um, but that was in later decades, uh, who worked in Aruba. He went to, uh, he was a well-known Dominican cricketer, national cricketer. His name was David Defoe. He went to Holland and he works there. But there are Dominicans who were in Curacao who went to the Netherlands Antilles. Others who did not go to the United States or Canada or England went to islands in, in, the, in the West Indies. There's one Dominican I can tell you, his name was Ruse Elwin, who went to Kerosene in 46. After he was repatriated, he ultimately went to Trinidad, where he got a senior job in the Trinidad oil refinery. There's a St. Lucian guy called Clyde Griffiths, who did so well after he left Kiroso, he became an international oil refinery consultant. He, um, he was hired in a number of different countries. He helped establish an oil refinery in Saudi Arabia. He's presently, he may have died recently, but uh, he made his home in the United States. So Kiroso was a springboard for the success of many of these immigrants. Yeah. Not all. Is there also um, another question, uh, meaning is there also a kind of shared identity of repatriated or... Um moved on, like they say, moved on British West Indian inhabitants who um, have lived in Curacao. I guess yeah. the question is also, is that a, a platform or a communicating platform of all these uh, experiences of British West Indian immigrants? I, I should indicate parenthetically that Paul Revere just sent a message indicating that he studied in, uh, in Harden, Netherlands. Uh, he retired as an engineer. Uh, and bear in mind one thing, um, not only with France, but also with Holland, many of their sporting soccer in particular figures came, came from the islands, mm -hmm. you know, not only Martinique and Guadeloupe, but also Kyrgyzstan, quite frankly, you know, so there's nothing unusual about that phenomenon. Um, the, the, I know that, that, that being in Kyrgyzstan, it, in my view, helped break down the insularity of the islands. They certainly did. Now, unfortunately, um, what is happening in the islands now is a totally different story. But, but, but based on, on, on the information, based on the interviews I conducted, there was a significant degree of camaraderie among the workers, irrespective of the island of origin. And that augured very well for West Indian unity.
Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm receiving quite some comments. It's, it's too much to, to mention. I'm, I will try to keep um, um, note of them so you can contact them. But for example, just to throw a few names at you for a thank you for, for example, Donna Philbert, uh, Tamira La Cruz, uh, Cameron Gale, Adelina Jones, who's thanking you for the presentation because they are reliving and um, uh, recognizing the um, immigration and the history of their uh, fathers, grandfathers, grandparents who were um, British West Indian uh, immigrants um, who came uh, here. Um, and we have, um, I just have, I see that we have to round off, see if we have some more um, less no. questions. I, I can tell you that Mike Jacobs, I just saw it on the screen. Uh, I think I didn't get the full question, but I think he said something to the effect that racial discrimination has many forms. Mm -hmm. And I think he made reference to contemporary Kiriso. Uh, if that is what he's asking for, I mean, I would be happy to comment on it because again, as I said, uh, during my visit to Kiriso, um, although I as a, well, I regard myself as an Islander, so to speak, um, although I've lived more out of Dominica than within Dominica, um, I, I could, it, it, it troubled me to some point. Um, in the islands, particularly on account of the heritage from England, there is a class and caste structure, not as strong as it might be, for example, in India. But unfortunately, social standing in the islands, then still, but not as much, was defined on the basis of complexion where you live because there was a correlation there was a correlation between complexion and your position in society can you hear me yes i'm hearing you yeah complexion and 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 social standing and i could see that was still evident to some degree in kirso the correlation between complexion in other words the infatuation that we have with the color white. Uh, I think it was still evident. One of the ex interesting experiences I had, my cousin, Carol Bertrand, took me to the old market. Um, I should indicate that I'm a hopeless shopaholic. Um, so I went looking around and one of the ladies, well, more than one, quite frankly, was selling something which shocked me because I've never seen it before, skin whitening. And uh, it was almost like a dose of reality. The whole question of uh, the necessity in 2012, and we're now in 2022, of, uh, of, of, of the need for skin whitening um, in an era where Kiriso was moving inexorably towards independence. What is the significance of this? And speaking to certain persons, colorism, as someone defines it correctly, um, is still very much alive and well. And in my view, that is an indictment of us as an independent, proud nation, as a nation of people who, who, who have embraced its past, as a nation in a very generic sense of persons who are comfortable in their skin. Um, because in my respectful view, we have accomplished sufficiently that we can stand tall irrespective of any hurdles or impediments um, yes. that put in our past. And that is the trajectory in my view of our history. That is the road I hope we will take proudly uh, as we march towards self-realization, as we march towards a society that we will be proud to bequeath to our children. Another thing which, which troubled me is the justice system. A disproportionate number of judicial officers in Kiriso were from Holland, white. I have nothing against white judicial officers. It doesn't matter to me. But the fact of the matter, when I went there in Kiriso, there was a significant dialogue that these judicial officers, they were not sufficiently knowledgeable of, of local conditions as a result of which they were imposing lenient sentences on persons charged and convicted of rather very criminal, very serious criminal offenses. 
And this is, in my view, a significant problem. The judiciary has to reflect the society. The judiciary has to reflect the community. You cannot have tropes of inequality defining who become a judge, who becomes a judge, and who does not. Yeah. If the judiciary that. is not reflective of that society, then you're going to have issues. Mm -hmm. And that, hopefully, it has been addressed in Curso, but in my view, that is as a concern because it can fester. Canada, and Canada is not a utopia, but Canada has well or long embarked on a road of ensuring that the judiciary is reflective of the community. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, we have a long way um, to go, I guess. Um, and what, what you say, this story, your story today is very important for ourselves to start recognizing um, our, 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 the contributions of our own community. With that, I have one last uh, question to round off uh, this uh, session. It is a question from Wendy York. And um, she, her grandparents migrated from uh, Guyana to Curacao. And um, the last question will be about women. What about, about the contributions of women? Um, because also I, I see um, comments from other people who are rightfully saying that not all, all that the British West Indian immigrants were not all working at uh, the refinery. Some of them were taxi, some of them were seamstress, uh, chauffeurs, I mean taxi chauffeurs, some were seamstress. And um, uh, the last question to round off, maybe you can say something uh, short about the women. And you're absolutely correct. There was a degree of gender, gender inequality in terms of who migrated, the numbers and the positions they held. A number of persons, women, for example, came to Curacao to work what was euphemistically called domestics uh, for uh, well-to-do Curacao families. My mother was certainly one of these uh, individuals and so on. Um, many of them um, got married uh, to, uh, to some of the migrants. Many of them went back. And, uh, and I made reference earlier to, to the number of businesses established by workers who'd returned to the respective islands, certainly in Dominica. And these were not just men. In fact, one of those, well, just one, there are others, um, was one who is my mother's sister, was named Faustina Charter. Charter was a, 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 a former worker from Grenada. She established a thriving business. She was able to send her, all her children to secondary school. Um, there was another one who I made mention, the Murillo family. Again, he established a thriving business. He was able to educate his children. One of them is now a lawyer in Toronto. One is a retired accountant in, in, in Montreal. So these, them, these women were very enterprising women, many of them. And bear in mind one thing, I mean, there was a significant amount of gender discrimination uh, within the British Caribbean, within Kiroso in my respectful view, uh, at the time, you know? Uh, but many of them were able to overcome that. But many of them, the unfortunate reality is that many of them were cast in roles, gendered roles, roles prescribed by their gender. And that is something that we cannot ignore. That is something we have to admit, because again, to the extent that we are moving towards a greater equality and acceptance of everyone, irrespective of their race, color, complexion, country of origin, we have to be able to afford every person, male or female or whoever, an equal right to succeed in the society. In Dominica, I can say there's progress along those lines. I have to say that there's progress in Kyrgyzstan also, uh, because I did meet a couple of uh, attorneys, uh, female attorneys in Kyrgyzstan, who seem to be quite happy in terms of their, 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 their success and so on. But it is a journey, it is not a goal. And just my little, inter my little uh, assessment of what was happening in Kyrgyzstan, there seems to have been a wall a ceiling above which certain persons, particularly of daughter origin, were predominant. And that is an indication that there is still work to be done. There certainly is, yeah. Well, on this thank note, um, I will have to uh, end this session. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Irving Andre. And I want to thank all the participants. Yeah, the, the book. Uh, um, there's some questions about how people can. Uh, I will. 
I can I will, the um, I, I what I can do is to provide my email. Okay. Because I don't know if there are any more left in Dominica, quite frankly. Right. And I, at least I can. Um, hold on. Let me just type my email. And pardon, I'm still using my typewriter, so give me one minute. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Andre. And then I think more people will contact you about the book and uh, the other issues we talked about. Well, it was a great pleasure. I thank yeah. you for inviting me. As again, I applaud yeah. the work you're doing in preserving Curacao's heritage. Right. Uh, I wish we can take a leaf from your book in, uh, well, in Dominic or in any way. Sure. Um, because we have to preserve our history so that those who come after us can understand and can be motivated can be motivated even more than 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 we to 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 push the envelope so to speak exactly exactly yeah that's what, what we are from my to. part yes from my part also thank you very much uh, i have to apology my apologies to those questions because we have seen quite some that we weren't able to um, address today but um everybody will receive the link and like you said we got your um contact so they can contact you or us to um, address the questions that were not answered today. Thank you very much. And uh, again, once again, I commend the work you're doing. I thank the participants. Um, and I hope that certainly we can move on to even greater things as a community, irrespective of the island that we now inhabit. So mm -hmm. thank you, bon dia, and good bon to dia. see you. Thank you, enjoy your weekend. Wonderful. Bye. Okay, bye.